few weeks ago, we, we started a series called Psalm 23, which is all about Psalm 23. Uh, we, we set it out to be a six-week series, uh, which works out really well because there are six verses in Psalm 23. So the goal was to do one verse at a time. However, last week we took a brief pause from this series for a very good reason to say goodbye to Jamie Snyder and his family uh, as they follow God's call to plant a church uh, in South Florida. Um, and so the week before that, Jamie taught on verse 2 as scheduled, but also dove into verse 3. And so today, I, I'm going to do a quick recap of everywhere we've been, and then we'll, we'll, we'll press on into verse 4 so that over the next couple weeks, we can do verse 5 and verse 6 by themselves and, and devote all of our attention to those. So we have a lot to do today, so we're going to dive in very, very quickly. David, David began Psalm 23 by, by simply saying, the Lord is my shepherd. Shepherd, I lack nothing. Now, it's really important that we remember when we're studying the Psalms uh, that the Psalms were written differently than, than other scripture that we may study, and therefore we have to study them differently. You, you see, oftentimes when, when we study something, we're engaging our minds. Uh, and it's important that we engage more than that when we study scripture, but especially when we study the Psalms, be, because the Psalms uh, were, were written as poetry. Uh, specifically, they were written as songs. These weren't just things that, that, that were written down by David and, and other Psalms writers. They, they were things that they sang out loud. Many of them come with direction at the beginning for choirs and, and orchestras, the music that's supposed to accompany them. They, they, they were songs. They, they were to be sung and, and celebrated and shared amongst them because they conveyed deep emotion. You, you see, music has this ability oftentimes to convey things that regular words just can't convey. We, we know this and we see this throughout Scripture. It's why God, you know, encourages people to sing so often, oftentimes commanding his people to sing. And, and consistently we see God's people responding to God's realities with song. We see it in the very beginning in Genesis. Genesis at the very beginning when God creates the heavens and the earth and then he creates all the things in the heavens and the earth and he creates Adam and then he gives Adam, Eve, a, com a companion to walk beside him, to do life with him. The first time Adam sees Eve, he busts into poetry. He says, bone, flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone, this is woman, she was taken out of man. It was a poetic way of saying, she completes me. Now, he could have just said, she completes me, but, but that wouldn't have captured what he was feeling. So instead, he, he gave this poetic rendition of the fact that where I am weak, she's going to be strong. And where she is weak, I'm going to be strong. We're going to make each other better. Sometimes song and, and, and poetry convey things that mere words can't do. And so it's hugely important as we study Psalm 23 and other psalms that we keep that in mind, that, that this is a big moment for David. This is an emotional moment for David. He is conveying things that he simply can't sing, he, he can't say, he must sing them. And so one day, as David is sitting in his field, actually watching over sheep because he's actually a shepherd, it dawns on him, the Lord is my shepherd. And therefore, I lack nothing. You see, David knew intimately what it meant to be a shepherd. He knew intimately what it meant to be a sheep. And he knew the importance of the relationship between a shepherd and his sheep. And so it's hugely important if we're going to understand Psalm 23 and we're going to understand what it means for us and, and the reality of the relationship that it's describing, we have to lean into that imagery. So as we recap it, we're going to lean heavily into the imagery of sheep and shepherd. We're going to put ourselves in the position of a sheep because that's who we are in this passage. But we're going to keep in mind that the star of this passage, the focal point, is the shepherd. And so when David said, the Lord is my shepherd, he, he was conveying that the Lord could, you know, could, could not be a shepherd to anyone, but he is a shepherd to me. He, he is close. He, he is intimately invested in me. He, he has chosen to lead me. He has chosen to be my, I am his sheep. And because he is my shepherd, I lack Nothing. You see, verse 1 kind of sets the scene. The rest of Psalm 23 are, are all examples of how this plays out, how the shepherd provides this intimate care to the sheep. And that's why David then immediately says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. Three things that, that sheep need to survive. They need to eat, 
They need to rest and they need to hydrate. They, they need access to water. They, they, uh, sheep are, are a lot like goats in that they can and will eat anything, okay? Like anything you put in front of them, they will eat. The, the difference, though, is that goats can actually survive that way relatively well by eating literally anything in front of them. Sheep can't. Sheep actually need a, a pretty balanced diet of vitamins and nutrients that, that can only be found in very specific sources uh, of sustenance. Sheep need lush green grass to survive. They, they have to have it. Sheep also need rest. Sheep are very prone uh, to, to stress. And if they get stressed, they won't rest. And, and if they don't rest, sheep will exhaust themselves and will perish. So sheep have to rest. Sheep, like most creatures on the planet, also can't live without adequate hydration. It's very important that sheep have all of these things. It's very important that a shepherd provide all of these things. Especially for a shepherd like David, this would have been a difficult task because he lived in an area where these three things weren't always readily available. You had to work for it. And so the task of a shepherd was to go and find these places, to find places where there was lush green grass to provide food for his sheep, where it was adjacent to clean fresh water, but also provided the circumstances by which a sheep could sustainably rest. You see, here's an interesting thing about sheep. In his book, A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23, author Philip Keller, who happens to be a shepherd of actual sheep and chose to write about Psalm 23, shares that there's actually four simultaneous circumstances that sheep have to experience if they're going to be willing to lie down. If these four things aren't happening, sheep literally won't lie down, they won't rest, and they will eventually stress themselves to death. So these four things have to be in existence. Number one is they must not be experiencing any fear. Sheep can't be afraid or they won't lie down. If they are afraid, if they think they're going to be attacked, if they think they're, they're, they're going to be you know, surprised by something, if they think there is a predator lurking, whether they can see it or not, they won't lie down. They won't rest. They'll, they'll stay on guard. They'll stay anxious. They'll stay on the mood. So a shepherd has to eliminate all threats. A shepherd has to take great care to ensure that anytime he wants his sheep to rest, there is absolutely no opportunity for a predator to attack, and the sheep have to believe that. And so until the shepherd is able to eliminate all the threats, the sheep won't lie down. Second thing, this is very, very interesting. They must not be experiencing any friction with their fellow sheep. Fun fact about herds of sheep, there's drama. There's constant drama in herds of sheep. Like they get in conflicts and they literally butt heads to decide like who's in control. There's a constant battle for hierarchy within any herd. And a shepherd's job is to eliminate that battle. It is to eliminate the stress and the strife uh, of the butting of heads. It's to literally bring peace and calm to the relationships between the sheep. Now here, maybe more than anywhere else, we remember why David is choosing to, to compare us to sheep. I mean, because we're the exact same way. How many of us lie in bed at night unable to rest because we're worried about the relational dynamic with another human being constantly? It may be more of a constant problem for us than fear. It, it, constantly we're experiencing the stress brought about by unhealthy relationships. And so it's very, very important that the, that the shepherd provide the means for healthy relationships. To ensure, literally, that sheep are living in healthy community with one another. They understand that they're a team. They understand they're a family. That they understand that they're all in it together. Like the shepherd actually has to work on these dynamics amongst the sheep. And it's very, very true for us as well. Our shepherd does the same thing. He heals broken relationships so that we can live in community. We were built for community. We actually can't survive without community because we simply won't be able to rest. We won't be able to find peace. Third thing that the, the shepherd must provide, they must be free from, from annoying pests like flies or parasites. The, the term you bug me literally comes from this. It's, it's sheep being harassed by parasites and flies and insects. They, they will go crazy if there's flies and bugs and insects, mainly because they're very dangerous to the sheep. We'll get to that later, but uh, they'll be so harassed that not only will they not lie down, they'll run around like crazy people, and they'll, they'll often run into high brush. They'll, they'll run you know, off of cliffs, they'll, they'll get stuck in holes, they'll, they'll fall into bodies of water and float away. Sheep do really dumb things when they're being harassed. Sheep do really dumb things when they're being stressed out. And they'll often get themselves stuck in precarious situations where not only can they not rest, but they're in extreme danger because what better way to be picked off by a predator than be stuck 
in a thicket. And so the, the shepherd has to take great care to ensure that there's none of these annoyances, to ensure, ensure that there's no distractions, to ensure that his sheep are not being harassed by anything so that they can lay down and rest. And then finally, the, the number four, they, they must know that sustenance of food and water are available. A sheep will not lie down and rest if it doesn't know where its next meal is coming from. And so, so a shepherd could have a great plan how tomorrow we're going to go into this lush green field and you're going to eat all day long. But if he tries to get the sheep to lie down and rest in a field that's not lush and green, they won't do it. Because until they see that other field, until they see their next meal, they, they, they won't calm down and rest. And so, so a shepherd has to take great care to take them to the green pasture, to lead them beside quiet water so that they see it, so that they know that their needs are met, so that they trust that it's okay to rest. It's okay to lie down. My needs are being met. And ultimately what we realize is that we have all of this in our Father. We we have all of this in, in the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords. He is providing the circumstances by which we can find peace even in the midst of chaos because we have no reason to fear. We, we, we can experience healthy community because of the bonds that he is forming and the rejuvenation that he is bringing to those relationships and the healing that he is providing. We, we can know that we're not going to be harassed by outside influences, that we're not going to be distracted by outside temptations, that we're not going to be attacked by anything, that, that we can calmly and patiently rest. And we know that all of our needs are met in our Father. All of our needs are met. This is why David can look out over his flock and it dawns upon him, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing because I have everything I need in God. Now, the work of the shepherd is not over. It continues into verse 3. First part of verse 3, David says, he refreshes my soul. Now, for many of us, we read that and we think the imagery is over, okay? Verses 1 and 2, they may have been about sheep and shepherds, but how on earth does a shepherd refresh the souls of his sheep? Well, in order to understand that, we have to understand what it means for a sheep to be something called cast or cast down. You see, there's this phenomenon with sheep, and that's that, that sheep, because of their proportions and, and because of a, a poor sense of balance that all sheep uh, hold, hold in common, uh, sometimes sheep fall over. Okay, literally, like, sheep will just be standing there, and, like, it's not because it's windy, it's not because they get pushed, like, they'll just lose balance and fall over. And when they fall over, because of their weight distribution, sometimes that sheep has a tendency to roll over on its back. And when a sheep rolls over on its back, it is completely unable to roll back over. A sheep cannot roll over onto its front when it lands on its back. And so that sheep is literally stuck there, legs flailing in the air. It cannot move. And at first it's humorous. It reminds us how dumb sheep are. But it's actually really, really dangerous. Because the longer a sheep is on its back, the more gases begin to build up inside its stomach. And the more gases begin to build up inside its stomach, the more pressure it puts on their vital organs. The more pressure it puts on their vital organs, the more those organs are stressed, the more they lose circulation, and eventually they actually suffocate and die. Now, on a hot day, this can actually happen as quickly as within one hour or a couple hours. Like, like this can happen very, very quickly quickly. And so it is absolutely imperative that shepherds remain vigilant. You see, a a synonymous word with refreshes is reset. Constantly shepherds need to reset their sheep. Literally turn the sheep over when the sheep has lost balance, when the sheep has lost equilibrium, when the sheep has found itself stuck. There's a lot of reasons they may get stuck. But the fact of the matter is when they're stuck, when they're cast down, they are in a desperate situation. Fun fact about my wife and I, Natalie, we've both lived in Northern Ireland, but we didn't live there at the same time. Ironically, we lived in the same area and we have a ton of mutual friends from different time periods in Northern Ireland, but we didn't live there at the same time. It's very complicated. I'll explain it some other time. But when Natalie was living there, uh, she, she, a mutual friend of ours, a guy named Alistair, he was kind of the driver for her group that, that she was there kind of working and, and, and partnering with. And so he would drive them dif- different places. And one day Alistair w- was out driving the team and they were in a van. They were on the beautiful Irish countryside. And all of a sudden Alistair slams on the brakes, like abruptly slams on the brakes. He jumps out of the car and he starts running and he yells at everybody, follow me quickly, like everybody. And everybody's like, what the heck is wrong with Alistair? Like he's gone crazy. And so he jumps a fence and he just goes running like a madman into a field. 
And so everybody follows them. They all go running into this field, and eventually they, they come to this sheep, and the sheep is lying there on its back. And, and uh, initially, like everybody in the group's laughing at the sheep, like, look at the dumb sheep. It's on its back. You can't move it. Alistair's like, we must take action immediately. And like everybody crowds around, and they flip the sheep over. The sheep happily runs away. And everybody's like, what the heck is going on? Like, what, what was that? And Alistair's like, that sheep could have died any minute. Like, in all seriousness, like, that sheep could have perished if somebody didn't take immediate action. Being cast down is a very dangerous place to be. This is why David said this in Psalm 42, verse 5. He says, why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? David's realizing his soul is cast down. Okay, he feels defeated, and he's like, my soul's cast down. My, my soul is stuck. It's a very dangerous place. But why are you doing this, soul? We can't stay here. And he says, hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation. It's David, again, reflecting on the reality of a shepherd, knowing that, hey, sometimes my soul feels like it's been flipped upside down. Sometimes my life feels like it's been flipped upside down. We've been there. Maybe you're there currently. You, you feel stuck. What David's saying is, is my hope is God, my vigilant shepherd who will come running and he will rescue me and be my salvation yet again. He refreshes my soul. He resets my soul every single time it gets flipped upside down. He doesn't leave me there. He doesn't leave me there with my legs failing, you know, awaiting certain suffocation. He, he flips me over and he resets my soul. He goes on in, in, in verse 3 to say this, he guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Another fun fact about sheep, sheep are extreme creatures of habit. They will literally do the same thing over and over and over again unless somebody stops them and, and teaches them to do something different. This, this most readily uh, uh, presents itself in, in their pursuit of food. If sheep find a lush green field, they will continue to go to that lush green field until somebody shows them a different one. They will just keep going to the same source of food over and over and over again. And when they go there and when they come back from there, they will take the exact same path. Why? Because sheep have terrible memories. This is one of the reasons that sheep often wander into danger because they, they wander off stubbornly trying to find their own way. They forget where they're going. They forget where they are. They forget who they are. And eventually they're stuck. And so sheep, knowing that about themselves, will at least walk the same path every single time. Well, a few things begin to happen when sheep eat in the same place and walk the same path over and over and over again. And that's that they start to strip that field of all of its natural nutrients. They, they eat all the good stuff. And then by walking the exact same path, they start to create ruts. And the combination of a stripped field and ruts uh, allows for erosion to start taking place. And pretty soon, good, healthy grass isn't growing there. The only things that can thrive in erosion-ridden fields start to grow there, which is weeds, many of which are poisonous to sheep, many of which attract dangerous parasites. And if so, if left to their own devices, sheep will literally eat the same thing in the same place and walk the same path over and over again, thereby destroying the field and actually making it toxic to them. They'll eat themselves to death in that field. They'll, they'll eat things they shouldn't, they'll get attacked by parasites, and they will eventually die out of habit. And again... <laughs> We're the same way. Like, like, think about it. Like, how often do you do the same thing out of habit, somehow expecting other results, but only finding the exact same end again and again and again? Habitually, we do things that we know are bad for us and try to convince ourselves that it's going to be different this time, but we just keep going back to the same things, walking the same path, and, and slowly it's killing us because we need a shepherd to show us something better. And so one of the tasks of any good shepherd is to constantly lead his sheep to better sources of food, to give a field a break. And so literally what shepherds will do is they'll section off different parts of the field and they'll just rotate. And so they'll let the, the sheep eat here and then they'll move them here and then they'll move them here. And, then they'll, and, and it's allowing each section of the field to recover. When I lived in Northern Ireland, I actually had multiple friends who were sheep farmers. And so I got to see this phenomenon in action. And, and something really neat happened when this would happen. Anytime a farmer would open a new field and let the sheep in, th this happened. Like, like tried and true every single time. As they moved into the new field, young and old, all the sheep would literally jump for joy. 
Like, it was crazy. Like, they'd move into the field. They'd start jumping around. It was almost like they were dancing and celebrating, and they running around the field. They got so excited about a new field. It was like they were saying, new food. Like, we're, gonna, we're not going to die. This is amazing. They get so excited. But it's because they know the shepherd cares about them. They know the shepherd knows them. They know the shepherd knows their needs. They, 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 he knows what's going on inside, and he knows what's best for them. This is why David uh, felt compelled to write Psalm 139, specifically the prayer in verses 23 and 24. He said, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. God, I need you to know me. I need you to know what's going on. I need you to know my bad tendencies. I need you to know what I need so that you and you alone can lead me to something better. He guides me along paths of righteousness. He takes me better places. For his name's sake, for his glory, for his renown, he leads me to something better. Because if left to my own vices, I'm going to walk the same path and do the same thing over and over and over again, even though it's slowly killing me. So I need a shepherd to take me to something better. Now, all of this brings us to verse 4. And verse 4 provides a really interesting transition uh, in Psalm 23. You'll notice that that literally the tone and the language starts to change at this point. In verses 1, 2, and 3, David was very much talking about his shepherd. He was talking about his relationship with God. But what you'll notice in verse 4 is he starts talking to God. Okay, he says this, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now, so much about this verse actually correlates to a shepherd's calendar. Okay, here's what, what I mean by that. In the fall, winter, and spring months, all, all shepherds and, and their sheep did, did generally the same thing. It, it was all spent at the farm, rotating fields and doing all those things we talked about in verses 1, 2, and 3. But summer was different. In summer, in this region and regions like it around the world, shepherds actually take their sheep on a journey. They take them up into the mountains. Now, the reason they do this, there, there's lots of reasons. One, it you know, kind of gives the fields a, a longer break through the summer. You know, uh, a lot of it has to do with weather and climate. It's just for a lot of reasons, it's better to take your sheep up into the mountains for the summer and then bring them back down for the fall, the winter, and the spring. It's, it's better to be at the farm during those months. It's better to be in the mountains in the summer. But the only way to get to the mountain was to go through the valley. There's a lot of reasons for this. One, it was the easiest path. No shepherd wants to go mountain climbing with his sheep. And so the valley allowed it, uh, you know, it got steep every once in a while, but it was a more gentle grade to get up into, you know, the sustainable fields up in the the mountain. The other reason was valleys are are where you're going to find rivers and streams and and sources of clean, fresh water. And thereby, that's where you're going to find the most lush green grass. So so the provision you need to give your sheep along the way, it's only going to be found in the valley. So the only way you're going to get to the mountain is to go through the valley. But the valley was a very, very dangerous place. Why? Because in this part of the world, most of those valleys had steep cliff walls that that encased them. And so once you were in the valley, you're kind of stuck in the valley. There's nowhere to go. And a lot of things called the valley home. You see, those natural resources that made it good for sheep also made it home for, for a lot of predators. And those predators, they, they knew the valley. They were used to the valley. And you could often find them lurking in the shadows provided by those valley walls, some places where sun never shone. And so lurking in those shadows were, were countless creatures like cougars and, and bears and, and wolves that, that desperately wanted to find a sheep that had veered off course, that desperately wanted to fe- find a sheep that was alone and isolated. In fact, they looked forward to summer all year long because they knew the sheep were coming through. So it was in the valley that the shepherd had to be more vigilant and take greater care than anywhere else. It was in the valley that the relationship between the shepherd and the sheep was most tested. But this was also the, the most intimate time between a shepherd and his sheep. You see, on the farm, they, they often interacted with other herds, and there may be other shepherds coming in and helping from time to time. But when you went up into the mountains, when you went into the summer, it was just you and your shepherd. And your shepherd would take great care to ensure that every single sheep was safe, that every single sheep was, was, was accounted for, that every single sheep's needs were being met, that every single sheep could find 
comfort. And so there's a few realities that, that, that David presents in, in this passage. Number one, as we apply this to our own lives, we're reminded that, that we will walk through valleys. Okay, David's not saying, hey, you might find yourself in a dark valley. You might move toward it. We're, we're going through the valleys because in life you will go to the mountaintops. In life you will have those mountaintop moments with God. But the only way to get there is through the valley. You will move through valleys. You've been in valleys. Some of you are in valleys right now. You will experience valleys. And second reality is this. When you're in a valley, you will encounter evil. You will. There is no promise in Scripture that says, hey, you're going to be free of all encounters with evil. In fact, it promises the exact opposite. But it also promises, like in Psalm 23, you have absolutely no reason to fear. Why? Because your shepherd is with you. And that third reality is that your shepherd is fully capable of bringing you comfort, bringing you peace, bringing you that, that circumstances that provide rest, even in the midst of the valley. Because he has the tools to do so. And then David kind of focuses on these two tools that, that every single shepherd would carry. Every single shepherd, would, would no shepherd would ever be found without these tools. And, and it's a rod and a staff. And the rod, the rod was like a club-like thing. It was often crafted from a sapling. They, they'd uproot a sapling and they'd carve it down. They, they'd carve the, the roots into a, a kind of this ball and then they'd shape the handle. And every rod was, was tailored to its shepherd. And so it was the exact size and, and length and weight that, that made it most usable for them. And they would practice their whole lives using this thing. And so it, it was a very powerful tool in their hands. And it was kind of a Swiss army knife of, of, of sheep protection. You know, uh, it did a lot of things. You know, most notably, it, it fended off predators. They, they could hit the predator with it. They could throw it at the predator. They were deadly accurate when throwing the, the, this thing. And, and so it could be used to fend off predators. It was also used to correct sheep. Okay, so as, as, they're, as they're leading the sheep through the valley, you know, it's very important that all the sheep stay together and every once in a while one would, one would stray. And so the, the, the shepherd had to walk in a way that he could see all the sheep and he, he would take great care to notice any stragglers. And if you started to, to stray from, from the flock, you, you, you would get the rod thrown at you. Sometimes it, it was just thrown and it landed next to you and, you know, you knew, oh, I got to get back. But sometimes for really stubborn sheep, it hits you upside the head. Like they throw it at the sheep and they were super accurate with it. It was never to harm the sheep. It was always to correct the sheep, to wake the sheep up. Say, hey, you're veering off course. That's dangerous. You don't want to be out there. You want to be with us. You want to be in this community. You want to be close to me. And so it was a means to get the sheep to come back. But the, the shepherd also used the rod to, to take intimate care of the sheep. You see, like I said, uh, parasites are, are a real problem for sheep. Specifically when those parasites get beneath their wool. You know, sheep have, you know, thick wool, and the thicker that wool gets, the more matted it becomes. And it ultimately kind of forms like a shield, a barrier around the sheep, and some dangerous things can happen beneath it. As, as much as external dangers are a problem for sheep, internal are, are probably even worse. Because those pests, those, those, those insects, they can get in there and they can cause all kinds of problems. They, they've got to be taken out. Furthermore, the wool can also conceal wounds that the shepherd is completely unaware of. I mean, you know, sheep go walking through a briar patch, they get, they get poked, they get stabbed by a stick. There's, a, there's an open wound underneath the wool that the shepherd never knows about. It gets infected, sheep dies. And so a good shepherd had to take great care to check his sheep. So anytime they would stop and rest, the, the shepherd would pull the sheep close one by one, and he'd use the narrow end of the rod, and he'd, he'd separate the wool, and he'd, he'd check the sheep. It's another reason why Psalm 139, 23, 24 says, search me. Search me and know me. Look me over, God. Like, make sure there's nothing that's not supposed to be there. Test me and know my ancient thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me, anything that, 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 that's a blind spot for me. And heal me. This is what the shepherd would do for his sheep. This was the power of the shepherd's rod was, was the ability to protect the sheep. The ability to correct the sheep. The ability to refine the sheep. And we desperately need our Father to do the very same things for us. But, but then there was the staff. 
The staff's hugely important. It's more noticeable to us, the big candy cane looking thing. The, the staff was also a Swiss Army knife. Sometimes it, it yanked sheep out of danger. It literally pulled them out of things. They'd use the hook and they'd yank them out of the water. They'd yank them out of a hole. Sometimes it was used to pull the sheep close. You know, when, when they needed to check the sheep, sheep sometimes didn't want to be checked. And so you'd pull the sheep close and you'd embrace it and you'd check the sheep. But then the most common use of the staff was, was simply for walking with the sheep. For those sheep that, that tended to go off course, those, those sheep that, that were most stubborn, the, the shepherd would, would simply lean the, the staff to, to the side of the sheep. Wouldn't hit him with it. He, he wouldn't stab him with it. He would, he would just kind of rest it there, tap it every once in a while. Just a gentle reminder, hey, this is where we're going. Hey, this is the course you want to be on. Hey, I'm here. I'm with you. I'm watching. I got you. As we get to this point in the psalm, I can't help but go back to the beginning. David, the shepherd, sitting in his field, watching his sheep, and, and this song just bursting forth. And I have to ask myself, like, what, what, what motivated this? What inspired this? What, what was this song in response to? And ultimately, we don't know. David doesn't tell us. One day, we're going to get the opportunity to ask him. Really excited about that. But in the meantime, all we can do is speculate with, with holy wonder as to what was going on inside David, that this song exploded out of him. And for me, as I study the Psalms, I can't help but notice the, the happenstance of, of the fact that Psalm 23, which was written somewhere around 1,000 B.C., a thousand years before Jesus, comes right after Psalm 22. We're a little unclear as to when Psalm 22 was written, but, but just given the circumstances described in it, it was after Psalm 23 sometime. And Psalm 22, it's a pretty famous psalm. If it doesn't immediately trigger something, uh, it will. You see, it's, it's some of the clearest prophecy we have in the Old Testament about something that will happen a thousand years later when, when Jesus was hung on a cross. It's such a direct prophecy, in fact, that Jesus quotes it on the cross. You, you may remember Psalm 23, verse 1, it says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Those, those words left our Savior's lips as he hung on the cross. Rest of verse 1 says, why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? Before Jesus quoted it, David sang it. And why? It's confusing why Jesus would quote this from the cross unless you read the rest of it, unless you experience the journey of Psalm 22. See, it starts out as a lament, you know, David, David grieving over his like circumstances, David grieving about how hard things are and feeling alone and isolated like God has forgotten him. And he makes important observations like in verse 4, he says, in you our ancestors put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. David says, other people had hard times, other people experienced the things I'm experiencing, and you delivered them every single time. When are you going to deliver me? Then in verse 6, he says, but I am a worm and not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by people. It's almost as David is saying, listen, they had it rough, you delivered them. I have it rougher. God, look at everything I'm up against. And then he, and then he tells them, the, the majority of the rest of the psalm is David just lamenting about, I'm encountering this and this and this and this, and that the valley is all around me. It's consuming me. Then there's this unexpected twist. It's, it's abrupt. Like it comes out of nowhere. It starts in, in verse 26. All of a sudden, David's entire mood changes. His, his entire focus shifts. It's almost as if like God hit him upside the head with a rod and said, hey, pay attention. And he tapped him on the side with a staff and said, I'm, I'm here. Because then David says this, verse 26, the poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations will bow down before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nations. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him. Those who cannot keep themselves alive. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness declaring to a people yet unborn. He has done it. He's done it. 
So David, in in the midst of lament, thinking about how hard life is, suddenly shifted to this reality of like, "Eh, but it's not going to stay this way. I feel defeated now, but there will be victory. And it'll be worth it because someday our voices are going to join together and we're going to say he has done it because a king is coming. A savior is coming. A messiah is coming. One, one that we have the good fortune of knowing. And we've seen what he did. And we now proclaim he has done it. I have to imagine, I have to imagine, that when the Holy Spirit inspired the canon of Scripture, when it, when it got put together, and somebody sat down and took all of David's poetry, all of David's songs, and, and put them in what seemed like a random order, perhaps, that somehow Psalm 23 landed right after Psalm 22. I have to imagine that the Holy Spirit, in his infinite wisdom, wanted us to read those words. He has done it. And then immediately be transferred to a field where a shepherd overlooks his sheep. And suddenly it dawns on him, oh my God, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along paths of righteousness for his name's sake. I walk through the darkest valleys, but I don't fear any of it. Because he's with me. His rod and his staff, that's that's what brings me comfort. Whether it was that or something else, something inspired David to sing. And it inspired him to pour out his heart and say, God, you're my shepherd. And here's what it means. It means I'm not afraid. No, I'm comforted. Because you're good. And you're enough. My prayer is that we're able to proclaim the exact same thing today. Because out there is chaos. Out there, there is very little that makes sense to me. Out there, it's hard. But we don't have to fear any of it. Not one bit of it. Because he's with us. And his rod and his staff, his power and his presence, they comfort us. We pray for us. Father God, we simply say thank you. Lord, that you are a shepherd, and because of that, we can rest. We can rest assured that, that our needs are met. We can rest assured that we are safe. We can rest assured that we can live in peace with, with ourselves and, and with one another. We can rest assured that we will not be harassed or abandoned. That our souls will be refreshed. That you, Lord, will lead us on paths of righteousness for your namesake. And even though we will walk through dark valleys, dark valleys that sometimes feel endless, dark valleys that that sometimes feel oppressive to the point that we may perish, we will not be afraid because you are with us. And it's your power and your presence, the rod and the staff of our good shepherd that come for us and make us whole. It's in Jesus' name I pray.